That's great. Well, there'll be plenty of time for everyone to get in, but I just wanted to welcome everyone to our webinar today. I'm Kim Workmeister. I am um, one of the, uh, the one of the co-leads for our cesarean project right now. Um, I'm joined today by my colleagues Julie Basher and Amanda Woods. We are going to be monitoring the chat box during the entire webinar while our our host, uh, Dr. Elliot Main, walks us through our webinar today. The topic for today is documentation and coding guidance for guidance for labor induction and transfusions. And as we see by the overwhelming response that we got to this webinar today, this is one of those topics that we know that hospitals, not just in California, but across the country are really struggling with. And, you know, as we've moved from ICD-9 to ICD-10, Hospitals are trying, uh, you know, as as much as they can to make sure that we have complete specificity in in our coded uh, documents too. And now that transparency is reaching an all time high, which is a great thing. We need to make sure that that data that's being released to the public, to our providers, to payers is accurate. And so that's why we wanted to take this time today to make sure that we went through some of the, the tips and tricks that we have learned when it comes to ICD-10 coding for a few of the issues in maternal safety. So um, even though everyone is muted, please know that we are all going to be monitoring this chat box. We want your questions to get answered. And we, as soon as you type them in, we will get them answered at the, the first available opportunity. So don't be shy. This should be interactive for all of us here too. We don't wanna just be talking at you. And we want you to be able to get as much out of this as you can. Additionally, since there are so many folks who have uh, registered for this webinar, we realize there may be some, some issues with some who weren't able to get in, weren't able to register, and you might have other, other people that you wanna share this with. We are going to work as quickly as possible to get the webinar recorded and get the slides and the recording up on our website as soon as it is available, which should be about two days. Um, be looking for our web at our website at cmqcc.org for the slides and the recording so that you can pass this along to anyone else that you think might benefit from it. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Elliot Main. Thank you, Kim, and thank you, Julie and Amanda. Uh, this is truly a, uh, a overwhelming uh, uh, a group who attended today. Uh, I normally speak on clinical topics as the chair of uh, the California Maternal Quality Care Collaborators, topics such as hemorrhage, preeclampsia, uh, and the like. But one thing we've learned with all of those clinical projects is the importance of data. And therefore, uh, not only do we do clinical quality improvement, but we do data quality improvement projects to go hand in hand. Uh, and as we have seen, as we've been working on some of our more recent projects, the transition to ICD-10 has raised some data quality issues. Uh, and there's two in particular that have jumped out at us, which are, hemp, which are uh, uh, how to code labor induction and how to code transfusions. And we want to, under, understand what the barriers are and some of the strategies to overcome them. Uh, we, we're going to talk just a little bit about who we are at CMQCC and why you should be interested in improving coding if you're a clinician, uh, and then share with you some of the very good resources that we've either developed or partnered or found uh, that are for general obstetric ICD-10 coding. And then we're going to focus in on labor induction and uh, transfusions. So CPQCC and CMQCC are the oldest uh, perinatal quality collaboratives in the country. CPQCC was founded in 1996, uh, but it's focused largely on NICU uh, quality improvement projects. Uh, and then in 2006, the state of California asked us to form a a sister uh, collaborative for maternal focus for addressing maternal mortality and severe maternal morbidity. So we've developed toolkits for early elective delivery. We did with the March of Dimes, OB hemorrhage, preeclampsia, and then most recently uh, supporting vaginal delivery and for cesarean uh, prevention. We do a, a host of quality improvement collaboratives, uh, have done the toolkits that many of you are familiar with, uh, but we're also focused on on data quality improvement. So these are our three main areas that we focus on. 
maternal mortality, morbidity, the development of quality measures for maternity care, and then large-scale quality improvements such as, you know, California has 250 hospitals, 500,000 births, and we're just wrapping up 826 hospital collaborative uh, that uh, Julie, Julie Basher and Valerie Cape uh, and I helped lead in California for hemorrhage and preeclampsia. What, what is critical for all these activities is having a robust data center. Uh, and this allows us to really uh, hone in uh, in a rapid cycle way on clinical elements, but also understand data quality. Uh, working in our partners with the State Department of Health, uh, we have access to every birth certificate in California 45 days after the end of every month. Uh, and then we link that uh, with hospital discharge diagnosis records that we're getting from an ever-increasing number of hospitals. We're right now we're up to about 180 hospitals in California uh, for their hospital discharge diagnosis file, ICD-9, ICD-10. So this allows us to have a lot of real-time experience with ICD-10 uh, and can compare and contrasting it with birth certificate data and with historical data of ICD-9 for a large number of hospitals in California. So just a, a moment on the maternal data center if you're in California, and we also work in Oregon and Washington State with their state quality collaboratives. Uh, the data center is really a very important and valuable tool for quality improvement. It's we call a one-stop shop to support your hospital's obstetric quality improvement initiatives and your service line management uh, for maternity care. Uh, over 30 uh, hospital performance measures are calculated from this uh, uh, union of these two data sets uh, reporting within 45 days but with no further data collection burden. Uh, we, for some of the measures we do, for some additional measures we do uh, wants you to, to double check some of your data or add a supplemental clinical file. We're working actually uh, on this to be able to be downloaded from your electronic health record, uh, and that's, that's really the future of a lot of things. But we also can do things like provider level statistics for use internally in your facility. Uh, we give you a lot of benchmarking statistics, how you compare uh, to other like hospitals uh, or all, all the hospitals in your hospital system or uh, all the hospitals in your community. Uh, and we can facilitate then reporting uh, uh, of these measures to external folks like LeapFrog, Patient Safety First, and, and the HENS. Uh, so this is a screenshot uh, of, of what of of a taste of sort of of many of the measures that you can see uh, for both standard clinical activities and then for collaboratives. And we're going to talk a fair amount about data quality measures uh, that are also part of, of what the data center can provide. Uh, what's important is this not only gives you a, a rate and how you, your rates compare, but it lets you understand what's in your numerator, what's driving your rate. Uh, and so you can drill down to individual cases that have been identified as numerators. Uh, and here's an example of, of a uh, early elective delivery measure. Uh, and this allows you to drill down and see uh, all the details of this case. And this was, these are two cases that fell outside uh, the criteria for early elective delivery. There were 38 weeks at a C-section induction. Uh, and did not in the, all the diagnosis codes. You hover over the diagnosis code, you see the actual term, uh, and, you, and this allows you to, to separate out what was documentation issues versus coding issues. So that's a, that's a theme that we're going to talk about with induction here, is that there's as many issues with induction and augmentation around documentation as there is around coding. So why is coding uh, really important for us as clinicians? Uh, historically, coded data is what uh, researchers and public health professionals have used to track trends and practices. Well, that's great for, for trends and, and practices uh, in the big sense, but that hasn't really impacted how we practice medicine at a hospital. But that is uh, the scope of use of this data has changed dramatically in the last 
decades. So now uh, we're really focusing on evaluating and improving quality of maternity uh, services so that you have organizations such, a, the, such as the Joint Commission, uh, uh, CMS, uh, Partnership for Patients, that are all are using coded data sets uh, that come from our, our hospital uh, discharge diagnosis sets. Uh, the nationally endorsed measures from National Quality Forum also use, uh, whenever possible, uh, these, these coded data sets because actually going through a medical record is extraordinarily expensive in terms of time and dollars. Uh, and and uh, everyone in the hospital wants to avoid that whenever possible as we look at quality measures. But that then puts the pressure on us as clinicians and coders uh, to get it right at the outset. So the performance measures I mentioned in the last slide are used extensively now to compare hospitals uh, and are publicly released. Uh, in California, we have released, uh, or it's now publicly available for every hospital in the state uh, through CHART and through the Department of Insurance and, uh, and the Hospital Association. Uh, the first birth low risk C-section rate or the NTSC C-section rate, the episiotomy rate, uh, the vaginal birth after cesarean rate, and the breastfeeding rate for every hospital in the state. So it's really important that we get it right. Uh, uh, and uh, we want to be sure not only that we get it right in terms of the cases that are going to be included in a measure, as well as cases that need to be excluded uh, or removed from a, a measure. For example, if you don't code uh, the diagnoses, uh, there are a lot of diagnoses for exclusions in the early elective delivery measure. Uh, you uh, may well uh, not to not do as well in that measure as you should. So uh, here's a, a, a simple example. Uh, you want to be able to if you don't if you do a repeat C-section and forget the code breach, uh, or uh, and it doesn't take that many, you can change your rates quite significantly. Uh, so this is a, a, a uh, an example where three. In this case, has changed the rate from 6% to 14%. So uh, we have to be uh, vigilant here. So I'm going to stop for a second and, and talk about three general coding resources uh, that we're, uh, we're going to have on our website that are, I want to refer you to for general introduction to ICD-10s for obstetrics. The first one uh, that we came across online, and I've talked with uh, the author of this, who is a senior coding consultant, and presented this to the California Health Information Association, which is a coders association. Uh, it's a uh, part of CHIA. Uh, and this is a very nice uh, slide set going through uh, the basics of ICD-10 for OB. So that's a good place to start if you're curious about ICD-10 in general for OB. Uh, earlier in uh, April, uh, Ann Castles and Brett Hart, who's uh, a coding consultant that's worked with us at CMQCC, uh, gave a very detailed uh, uh, coding webinar uh, on a variety of aspects of ICD-10. So it's much broader than today's. Uh, and this is uh, like 70 odd slides. Uh, and it's on, on our website and actually a recording of that webinar. So this would be a good companion today. We're also putting on our website the, uh, a summary, a three-page summary of coding advice for labor inductions, uh, which lays out a number of the issues that I'm going to talk about next uh, for labor induction, but it's a good three-page summary to, with some nice tables that can be used on labor and delivery. So just a, a simple background for ICD-10. The procedure codes are a bit onerous, uh, and it's like they're building a secret code. Uh, and with any secret code, uh, there are some pretty simple ways of, of doing translations or decoding of it, if you would. And it actually follows a pattern. Uh, so you start off with every procedure code with uh, the section of the code book, the body system, 
uh, whether what kind of an operation or procedure it is, uh, the body part you're working on, the approach, the device, and the qualifier. The device and the qualifier uh, are often uh, not used, so they're Z codes. Uh, and so for, this is an example with an episiotomy, it, uh, it represents uh, the an anatomic region, uh, a general anatomic region is what they are calling it, and it's operation eight, which is cutting uh, without draining or, or so forth. So this is just a simple cut, and the body part is a perineum on the female, uh, and it's external. So it's not like you're using a scope uh, or, or another another approach. So that all adds up to zero zero W eight N X Z Z, uh, which is a bit obtuse, and that's one of the problems with ICD ten uh, uh, procedure codes is they are made all very generic, and so they they are divorced from the uh, the actual uh, a diagnosis that it's used for, uh, and it's it's all being constructed by these seven seven characters uh, to serve that purpose. So this is uh, equals an episiotomy, and it's but it's sort of similar to the other types of codes that we're familiar with. The, a zip code is constructed in the exact same way. Uh, so, you know, any zip code that begins with a 9-4 represents the Bay Area, any zip code with a 9-0 is Los Angeles area, uh, and then you get narrowed and narrowed it down. Uh, and the same for uh, for barcodes and even QR codes. So the diagnosis codes are similar but, uh, but a, uh, a little bit more uh, obvious in that the the ones that we really pay a lot of attention to are the O codes. And it happens that O code stands for obstetrics. Uh, and then you, you can go into category and subcategory, uh, and then they have often extensions of the seventh digit if we're talking about which fetus. Uh, and so a brief presentation is O32.1 uh, with some X's at the end. So before we go into inductions, I want to say a few things about deliveries. Uh, and here, uh, we really, uh, uh, b before you can get anywhere in obstetrics uh, for quality of issues, you have to be sure you're, you're capturing all the births. And this actually, in the first months of ICD-10, was a problem. Uh, and part of the problem was people figured out these early ones that I'm seeing at the top of the screen you know, where it's sort of obvious if you look at the code book about what a uh, a low cervical or extra peritoneal, you have to understand extraction of products of conception means a cesarean. Uh, again, it's not not an obvious one, but an extraction uh, is taking something out, uh, and uh, that can be done by a cesarean uh, or by low forceps, mid forceps, or vacuum, etc. Uh, but then there's the last one, which is not an extraction because that's just a delivery. Uh, and babies are called products of conception. Uh, and, you know, sort of, again, super generic. Uh, and a lot of folks didn't use either the, the, uh, the procedure code for a simple delivery, the 10 -E -E -O, the last one, 10 -E -O -X -C -Z or the O code at the bottom, O80, encounter for full-term and complicated pregnancy. Uh, and so that's, um, we're hoping this gets cleaned up. We're giving feedback to hospitals, but you've got to get the right codes to get you into the population to begin with. And again, uh, this is a set of, 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 uh, of characters that add up uh, when you have one of these, but you have to have at least one of these 10 delivery codes to get into the into the ball game. Uh, likewise, uh, but it's sort of, there are three procedure, procedure codes for cesareans that are all pretty straightforward: classical, low cervical, or extra peritoneal. They don't do uh, any extra coding for J or T incisions on a C-section. Uh, which is a little unfortunate, uh, but it's it's pretty simple, and, and this part is pretty 
transferable. Now, how, as I mentioned on, on the previous slide, the, uh, these are the codes that get you in the Joint Commission data sets uh, to begin with. Uh, and we had a problem with a number of our hospitals that we've been working on about not coding vaginal delivery. And this can screw up your quality metrics if you don't have that. So now we're going to turn to labor induction and augmentation. And let me say at the outset that this is really the classic example of where physician uh, documentation has a very strong interface with coder's ability to code. Uh, and it, we have to look at ourselves first on this one because we've had a hard time uh, over the years deciding which is which sometimes between an induction and augmentation. Some doctors will call this a early labor with uh, oxytocin and induction. Some will call that an augmentation. And likewise with ruptured membranes, uh, is that an induction or, or a uh, augmentation? And the American College of OBGYN put together uh, a, a multidisciplinary group to try and sort some of these issues out for a number of definitions uh, in 2014. And I was fortunate to co-chair this with Kate Menard from the University of North Carolina, uh, who was president of the Society of Maternal Fetal Medicine at that point. Uh, but it was really a very uh, multidisciplinary group that had public health folks, coders, uh, midwives, obstetricians, uh, pediatricians, uh, National Center for Health Statistics, all kinds of people uh, were there. Uh, it's published in obstetrics and gynecology, uh, but you have to go to this rather obscure site, and this is a disappointment on my side, to find all the, all the definitions online. And so that's, that's the citation for that on the bottom of the screen. So how one of the key ones we tackled was how to define labor and then how to define induction, and then how to define augmentation. But to define those last two, you have to define labor first. Uh, and you know, this actually took some time. It's sort of interesting to go through the textbooks and so forth to look at different definitions. Uh, it uh, starts off pretty simple, uterine contractions resulting in cervical change. Cervical change can either be dilation or effacement. This is not calling out a certain dilation or a certain degree of effacement, but it's change over time in the presence of uterine contractions. Uh, they called out two phases, uh, a latent phase and active phase. Uh, an active phase is typically beginning at six centimeters, uh, and that is rep representing the new research that's come out. So this is pretty straightforward. Uh, and then it gets more interesting when we look at augmentation and induction. So augmentation uh, starts off pretty simple, stimulation of uterine contractions using pharmacological methods, typically oxytocin, or artificial rupture of membranes to increase either the frequency or strength after following the onset of spontaneous labor or contractions. Or, I'm sorry, following the onset of spontaneous labor or contractions following spontaneous rupture of membranes. We're going to come back to this because this is a, a really important point where a lot of people have been confused or have had differences of opinion. Uh, and the labor, uh, if the labor has been started using any method of induction, including cervical ripening, uh, then you should not be using augmentation of labor. So if someone has a balloon, uh, cervical ripening balloon, uh, and they do that overnight, and then the next morning, they, uh, they're in early labor, perhaps, and they're using oxytocin to augment the labor at that point. That's not an augmentation. That labor is not considered an augmentational labor, but an induction. Uh, so any, uh, the key here, as we look at the next slide, uh, is that induction of labor is not just oxytocin, but it's any use of pharmacological or mechanical method to initiate labor. So this can be artificial rupture of membranes, balloons, oxytocin, prostaglandins, laminaria, or any other cervical ripening agent. And it's, it's there even if you're unsuccessful at it and you go to a C-section, but you never really get into labor, but you're 
uh, you're still zero uh, or fingertips, and then you do a C-section, you've had an induction of labor. Or uh, induction of labor applies if you are uh, doing an induction, doing a uh, pharmacological agent like oxytocin or sometimes prostaglandins uh, after spontaneous rupture of membranes if there's no contractions. This is the big underline here. Uh, uh, and this was meant to really help uh, uh, clarify this. So that if you're ruptured and you're having contractions, any, you don't have to be cervical changed because people don't typically do a lot of exams when you're ruptured membranes. But if you're contracting and you're ruptured, and, uh, but just not uh, in good enough labor in terms of frequency and you're getting oxytocin, that's an augmentation. But if you rupture and you have absolutely no contractions, that's a labor induction. Most of the time with ruptured membranes, by the time you start really getting to it, there are going to be some contractions. So most of those are probably going to end up being augmentations. But if you're sitting around at 12 hours, 18 hours with no labor, no contractions, then that uh, uh, would be an induction. So uh, this is in the handout, but we wanted to make it crystal clear uh, to the medical staff out of code um, to help the coding staff. So induction of labor, just to reiterate, includes all cases that you're using cervical ripening agents, uh, either either from medications or mechanical methods. Uh, or artificial rupture membranes before the onset of labor, or oxytocin before the onset of labor. Dr. Main, Can, I just want to, sure. real briefly, we have a question in sure. here, a couple of them that I think are this is the right time yeah. for them. Um, one yeah. question, they have a, a abstractor that state that breach delivery is not a code that is accepted as an exclusion of for PCO1. Um, also clarified yeah. that that case had yeah. rupture of membranes. So is it true yeah, yeah. that this case should not be considered part of the denominator for PCO1? Sure. Yeah, that was, I, I saw that too when I was going over this slide. Uh, Great. Preach is, preach is not a, 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 uh, a exclusion for PCO1. Uh, I think that got, that was the slide I took, and I think that was more uh, for NTSV C section, which it is an exclusion. Uh, okay. Rupture of membranes would be it would be an exclusion for PCO1. Okay, okay. So, sharp sharp eyed um, folks in the audience, I appreciate it. <laughs> They're good. They're good. Um, another question: Can we get a definition of uh, extra peritoneal C-section? So it's interesting. Uh, that's something that's not done very often anymore, but it's in all of our textbooks. It was done at a time in which there was concern about the spread of infection from uh, a long labor. Uh, uh, setting where you had chorium unitis, that the infection could spread to the peritoneal cavity, and then that's a, a, a bigger deal before the era of uh, modern broad spectrum antibiotics. So, uh, technically, uh, when you do the surgery of a cesarean, uh, you can peel back the peritoneal cavity, uh, uh, and essentially uh, separating it at the time of the bladder flap and not get into the peritoneal cavity. Uh, in, you know, in modern obstetrics, that's done very, very, very rarely. Uh, and it's just so much easier to go through the perineal cavity, and we really don't have much consequences of that. Uh, so that's a historical artifact, essentially. And then that last question here before we move on, um, says, I noticed that most of the time they don't specify high, low, or mid forceps. How can you tell? Well, uh, hopefully they're not doing high forceps. Uh, <laughs> That's also somewhat historical. Uh, it's done in an area, you know, you know from before the 1960s. And uh, uh, they should be uh, noting a low or outlet forceps, which is there's a rare mid forceps done. Uh, if they're not coding that, that's anywhere in their note. That's that's a concern because that's actually a pretty significant medical legal issue. Uh, for uh, as to what type of forceps it is. But forceps are uh, in many places uh, getting rarer and rarer, less than 1% of births. Uh, but I, I would send that back to the physician to document that because that does need to be in the medical record, and not only for you as a coder, but for um, medical legal reasons. Great. 
We have a few more coming in, but I'm going to let you keep going, and we'll we'll stop in okay. a little bit after that. <laughs> so, again, the key area to highlight with our staff, our medical staff, is augmentational labor only occurs after the onset, after the onset of spontaneous labor, defined again as contractions to cervical change, or after spontaneous ruptured membranes with contractions. And here, you don't have to have the cervical change again because you're not going to be doing a lot of exams at this point, uh, and if you're ruptured and contracting, you're going to be in labor simply. But again, if you're ruptured and absolutely no contractions, then it would be induction. So I wanted to highlight that and drill that one home because that is a tricky area for, for documentation and really needs to, to be spread onto the labor units. Uh, in, uh, in the handout uh, on the website, there's a, a nice table of this that I would recommend uh, putting up in labor and delivery, because this is the ACOG recommendation term, recommended terminology. So these are the ICD-9 codes for labor induction. This is pretty straightforward. There are three codes, uh, induction by rupture of membranes, induction by uh, uh, other surgical means, which is what they meant uh, by cervical dilators, or medical induction, uh, which is any medication to augment labor, or any, any medication used to induce. If it's a met oxytocin to augment labor, you're not supposed to use the code. So it should be clear that, that they didn't use the same, they had separate codes for artificial rupture of membranes after the onset of labor, which is not something that occurs in ICD-10. So ICD-10, uh, and we pulled together the codes, and I actually worked with coding clinics on this. Uh, for for advice, uh, and uh, as the Joint Commission came out with a list of, of codes that are flagged for possible inductions, and I'm going to go through their list and the now recommended codes in the next couple of slides. Uh, so in the ICD-10 uh, philosophy of making the codes as generic as possible, the use of oxytocin is described as administration of other hormone into a peripheral vein percutaneous approach. Uh, well, that kind of sets you back. You know, what are they talking about? Uh, but that is specifically uh, the code that's supposed to be used for oxytocin, the way we give it, uh, which is intravenously in a peripheral vein. Uh, and this is the coding clinic reference. And they specifically call out if you use oxytocin for augmentation, you do not use this code. So this is a code specifically for oxytocin for induction of labor. Uh, and it's sort of, you know, there, the in ICD-10 uh, and in general, you don't have uh, ICD codes for every every medication around the block. You don't, uh, but, you know, we use lots of medications uh, in, on, in any hospital with admission. There's only a few that are really associated with a significant procedure, if you would, that you actually code for separately than other medications. And this would be an example of if you're using oxytocin for induction, you should code it, and you should code it using this particular ICD-10 procedure code. Now, uh, but of course, we don't, there are other ways to induce labor, including putting medications into the vagina uh, uh, in, that are near the cervix, and that would be misoprostol, cervidil, and prepidil. Uh, and here again, because these medicines are being used for a defining procedure for the admission of labor induction, uh, they are coded. Uh, there's introduction of therapeutic substance into the female reproductive track uh, via natural or artificial opening, uh, again, pretty generic terms. Uh, but that is not to be used for other things that you might, that might fit that category, uh, you know, even misoprostol being put into the vagina for postpartum hemorrhage uh, would not, uh, in the coding clinic specifically say, you should not code misoprostol in that say, but only code it if it's being used for induction of labor, because that's tied to the reason for admission, essentially, is the thinking as opposed to a treatment for a condition like you would give antibiotics or something of that kind. 
So that's uh, the, medica the first one is a medication for labor induction uh, intravenously. The second one is a medication intravascularly. And the third one then is a mechanical dilator. Uh, and this would be balloons, more classically, but occasionally laminaria, uh, for cervical ripening for inductions. And that has its own set of codes uh, with their uh, uh, seven, seven character uh, that clearly defines that. So then there is, this page shows a set of codes that are uh, on the Joint Commission list that, that might be inductions. Uh, but they shouldn't generally be used for inductions. And so uh, the Joint Commission came out with their with their set of uh, recommendations pretty early on the game before the coding clinic came out with their clarifications and guidance. Uh, and for example, the first one is dilation of cervix with an intraluminal device uh, via natural artificial opening. This sounds like a balloon to to uh, for cervical dilation. Uh, you know, device in the in the uh, of the cervix. Uh, but the coding, but the Joint Commission uh, has not recommended this because, in general, when you talk about devices, they're talking about a device that you leave in and the patient goes home with it. Uh, and and so they're recommending the former code. But I I would suspect that if you see this code in obstetric patients, they're trying to tell you they're using a balloon. But it wouldn't be, quote, the correct code. But I, I would uh, double check that if you have, if you are reviewing cases and you see this code, I bet you they're using it. Uh, again, probably not not including the perfect uh, coding clinic guidance. And then the next set of codes is about uh, a drainage of amniotic fluid. You know, again, it's very generic term. Uh, you have to look at the rest of it. How uh, a uh, the one that's highlighted, the second from the bottom, is drainage amniotic fluid, therapeutic, uh, from the products of conception, okay, so that's breaking the bag of waters, uh, via a natural or artificial opening. So the natural opening to do this is through the vagina and the cervix, so this would be artificial rupture membranes. Again, you sort of have to fill in the blanks in your own mind uh, with the generic terms that are used in ICD-10. And now, uh, the other ones are typically used for an amniocentesis. Uh, not, we don't use an endoscope very commonly. That has occurred. Uh, you know, but the top, the second from the top would be drainage and arterial therapeutic with, op uh, actually this the third one would be percutaneous where you put a, a needle through the skin, uh, to, to, uh, drain amniotic fluid. That would be a classic amniocentesis. Uh, these, so the only one here that should come up and possibly for discussion here is the highlighted one. Uh, the, unfortunately in ICD-10, there is no longer to be a difference because it's, it's, it's divorced from the uh, overall diagnosis, diagnosis of induction of labor. This is how you do it. Uh, but so a, an artificial rupture membrane is no different if it's done for induction or from uh, augmentational labor, so then we have one code. So that doesn't help us. And, uh, but uh, it's a problem. Uh, so there's no real current code for induction of labor by artificial rupture of membranes. But in reality, that's not a very common procedure. Uh, it's pretty rare, uh, and it's particularly rare in first births. The types we typically do it in is, is a multip uh, who may be already dilated, uh, and she's sort of a gimme. If you were dilated uh, and multiparous, she's had several babies before. Those aren't the ones we really worry about. That typically goes quite quickly. Uh, and we'll come back to that in a moment. Uh, there's no, also no current code for induction by oral misoprostol. And this is an issue uh, as, as there are some studies in some you know, hospital practices now uh, in which uh, we're moving away from vaginal misoprostol to oral misoprostol. Uh, and the uh, guidance we've gotten from the coding clinics is that we really can't code an oral medication called out specifically. Um, 
So that's a, a potential issue. However, most of these cases end up getting oxytocin too. Uh, so that's just a kick off, if you would, of using the oral misoprostol to, to do some cervical ripening. But if they're using oxytocin, then that's the tip off. And that's the codable event, if you would. And so that would fall into the oxytocin use for induction we spoke of earlier. So I think, you know, these are, these are irritants, but I think they're not going to really affect us too terribly and we can work around these. I'm lobbying to have a, a code that just says, uh, uh, describes labor, whether it was induced, uh, with or without cervical ripening, or whether it was augmented, or whether it was spontaneous. And then we can use these procedure codes to say how it was done. ECOG is actually supporting that, and that's uh, going in as, as a formal proposal, uh, but the timeline is about two years. So don't hold your breath on that one, and we'll work with what we have. Uh, so. In the meantime, uh, as we get these codes settled, and I'm hoping uh, with this educational effort and some others that we can clean up our documentation and then our, get the right codes being used. But in the interim, we want to do some essentially rapid cycle feedback, a, 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 a PDSA cycle uh, where we review cases to make certain that the coding, documentation and coding is done correctly. So it's a perfect opportunity for a mini QI project. Uh, we, in our data center in California, uh, we're working with folks to try and do this, to support that. So we can flag cases for review, uh, particularly those that, have, that are involved with early elective delivery. Uh, that's an important one to, to look at because we're trying to identify those inductions and clean up the ones that are augmentations. Uh, and, you know, as we look at C-section rates, so uh, there's a lot of emphasis on labor induction uh, and the relationship of labor induction to primary cesarean. Uh, you failed induction rates, and so we want to get that, that right. Uh, we have tools in the data center that are to help you self-analyze your rate, but we, we've hold, held those back since ICD-10 until we can clean up the induction, uh, induction rate so forth. So here's an example of how you can compare and contrast. As we also remember, had the birth certificate uh, in California. Uh, and the birth certificate has, has a field on it that says back to day, whether the birth, birth was, the labor was induced or augmented. It's not perfect either. Uh, so, but we can, we can uh, pull these cases and compare and contrast. Here's on the left uh, of the flag is the ICD-10 coding. On the right is what the birth certificate said. And our goal here is to get them to be the same as much as possible. We'd like the birth certificate to read what the, uh, what the ICD-10 says and both be agree with the, uh, both the clinical record and what actually happened with the patient. Uh, so we're laying these out and then asking folks in their mini RCA, mini, uh, excuse me, uh, uh, QI project to confirm uh, and this is giving the feedback and helping to, to get people to code correctly. So is there any other questions on induction augmentation before I move to transfusions here? There, there are a few in here too, and I know there, there, we may not get to every single question, so just want to make sure that everyone knows that we will, we are recording all the questions here, and we'll also upload a, a Q and A from this, um, from this webinar when we up, upload the slides too. But questions we have right now, some of them are um, topics of debate. I think that are out there. What, what code is there? A code that's used when membranes are stripped? Is that considered no. an induction? Is there a code for it? No, um, there's not a code for it. Okay, and then yeah, um, that's uh, UCR. They say, or we're yeah. afraid to say. <laughs> we, yeah, that's been a that's been a topic of uh, debate for quite a bit in the throughout the, the the country with the hospital engagement networks too. I know that comes up often. Um, also, uh, there uh, another comment that, that they've used you know two and three doses of, of oral misoprostol in patients who really refuse or hate pitocin. It's clearly clearly an induction, but no pitocin was used. Do you have any suggestions for what to code in that? Yeah, that's a problem, uh, and we don't have a good code for that. That was one of the areas I spoke of where uh, the coding clinics really aren't recommending you code for oral misoprostol. Uh, if you have a lot of those, uh, 
uh, I'm not sure what to tell you. There is a code that the Joint Commission has has put in, which is the oral administration of a hormone. Uh, essentially, it's on, on on the Joint Commission list, but that's not what the coding clinics are, are recommending. So I can't give you guidance against uh, the coding clinics, mm -hmm. uh, and, and that, that's why we need a few new codes. Next, sure. Uh, next yeah. one, if both Cervidil and Pitocin are used, would you code both? Sure. Okay. Both, both would get you in. But, yeah, there's, there's codes for both. Why not? Okay. And then last question before you move on. Um, uh, episiotomy and repair was included in ICD-9. Um, in ICD-10, does the episiotomy include the repair, or is that coded separately? Do, do you know the answer uh, to that? Uh, the, there's... A, a nice review of that in the general OB coding guide, uh, thing that I would refer you to. It goes through that in detail. I don't have the slides but in this slide set for that. Mm -hmm. uh, so let me refer you there. That was the the first document that I, sh that I showed, and I'll show you it again at the end. So I have a couple okay, of slides great. now on transfusions. Uh, and this is an important area, and it's uh, confusing to a lot of people because we we started off in ICD-9 with just essentially four codes that we use in OB. Uh, you know, there are other codes for potential other weird tra or uncommon transfusions. Uh, but this this is where we live. You know, uh, you get, we rarely give whole blood, so it's mostly about PAC cells, 9904, or plasmas or other serums. So it's pretty easy. So ICD-10, again, makes everything uber generic. Uh, so it's you, you get these long codes and it's administer you you piece it parse it together administration uh, the operation is a transfusion putting in blood or blood products into the circulatory system so everything begins with three two o and then it's where you put it is the is the column on, here on the left uh, peripheral vein central vein artery and two arteries and is it open or percutaneous and then what you're putting in and is it autologous or non autologous as a qualifier you multiply these options out and it's 512 possible codes for transfusions and you get lists like this that coders look at and it is no wonder I glaze over however I love Greek mythology, and this is basically how Hercules slaying the many-headed Hydra, you know, one of the one of the labors of Hercules. Uh, and when you chop off the heads of the Hydra, you really get only a handful of codes that we would ever use. Obstetric. Ninety percent of our transfusions are single code. It is uh, in, in transfusion into a peripheral vein percutaneously. Uh, not, you know, we don't do anything open, uh, where you slice open a vein, uh, of red cells that's non-autologous. Autologous means yourself, and non-autologous means donated. So donated red cells into a peripheral vein. That's, so it's basically that one code. Uh, you know, the, the, the other 5% of transfusions or so are fresh frozen plasma, cryoprecipitate, platelets, and fibrinogens, which only differ by one digit. Uh, the, the letter of what it is. They're all going to be non-autologous. They're all going to be percutaneous. There is a slight chance that it could be a central vein. Uh, you know, if if uh, you have a long, you know, a massive transfusion, you put in a central line, uh, you could be coding the central vein. Uh, but that's that's the rarity. Uh, and at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter. What matters is that is uh, that they got a transfusion of this type of blood. So I want to leave you with this isn't so hard. Uh, it's what, but however, what we've heard through the grapevine is that some hospitals have thought this was a, such a big burden that they've chosen not to code transfusion procedures because it may not be directly affect their ability to bill and to get payment. But what I really want to leave folks with is the purpose of coding is not really all about billing. It's also for tracking and documenting quality uh, and performance. Uh, and we really are strongly encouraging because there's, say, an important obstetric quality measure that CDC is using, which is severe maternal morbidity, which involves blood transfusions. So we really want people to continue to code for transfusions and obstetrics. So, you know, we don't care 
uh, if, uh, you know, we're not asking that you count up every single unit a person has, you have to do that for joint commission, set an event, but then not for ICD-9 code. Uh, so we really don't want you to be overwhelmed by that 512 options, because it really comes down to 190% of the time and four or five for the, to get you to 100% of the time. Now, uh, the rubber in the road is, comes back to documentation again. Again, we're talking about key areas for medical and coding staff, and it's documentation of transfusion. Some coders have gotten hung up on the fact, well, the, the documentation in the medical record does not specify that it was in the peripheral vein versus the central vein. So what, what code do I use, you know, and in the absence of certainty, they've chosen not to code at all. Uh, and, you know, this is pretty easily remedied, and it's sort of annoying that, you know, that level of detail is required for the to get the perfect code, and we don't want the perfect to get in the way of the good here. Uh, but you know, in the meantime, we can change our forms for transfusion uh, to have standardized documentation that would include the site of administration. For we don't transfuse into arteries uh, in a, in most settings, and certainly never in obstetrics. It's peripheral vein or central vein. So you, you know, it's, uh, you can have it even pre-checked in my book. But you, it would be peripheral vein and percutaneous. Uh, that's percutaneous is you know 99.99% uh, uh, where, where I would uh, uh, would say would be used. So the EHR can be changed, or you have forms to do that. So in the absence of EHR, the spell check made it her. Uh, some hospitals have had a policy of a standard default coding that it's coded. If you can't find it, you go to peripheral and percutaneous, which is what's really we want for quality and outcome measures. Uh, and it really doesn't matter for those measures whether it is uh, central vein or peripheral vein, and it really doesn't matter to the patient either. So we, we went over the uh, uh, CMTC, the data center, uh, and we uh, or went through induction and augmentation and, and transfusions, the importance of the interface between documentation and, uh, and uh, coding, and how the two have to work together. And I'd like to, again, leave you with these, I think, very good resources for ICD-10 in obstetrics. Uh, and all, uh, all, you know, the first one goes through B and C, episiotomies, normal birth, all the all the routine kind of stuff. Uh, uh, and as a senior coding consultant uh, with all the uh, appropriate <laughs> initials after her name, I'm always impressed. I only had two letters after my name. Uh, and then uh, what we did uh, to uh, to really look at the interface of ICD-10 coding and perinatal outcome met metrics. Uh, and this is a, a, a more detailed description uh, and broader discussion than what we did today. Uh, and then the third one is, again, uh, a detailed handout for specifically about labor inductions. Three page, one page is about the documentation, one page is about the coding. And I did run this by the editor of the coding clinic, so it has, uh, it's, it, it's beyond what an MD says, we put it that way. Okay, so. Uh, I think we have a few minutes left uh, that we could uh, maybe address some more questions here. We do. We do. There, um, here's one. We have an issue with anemia of blood loss after postpartum hemorrhage. Coders don't like it unless a transfusion is given. Any ideas? Uh, well, it's – coders like, don't like to code things unless it's in, in the uh, – provider documentation, typically the physician uh, or midwife documentation. Uh, and so you can't code things like a, uh, you can't base your coding on a hematocrit of 20, uh, even though that's clear, clearly anemia, unless the physician has said we have anemia uh, and commented on there in their progress notes. So you either have to have a transfusion or the physician documentation of it. Of, of anemia. It's, um, yeah. Also, another one, what code should be used for FFP? Uh, 
there, let's go back. So uh, we have uh, K and L here, if you would, uh, frozen plasma or fresh plasma. Uh, and, uh, and you're asking about what we call fresh frozen plasma, FFP. And the, it's frozen. Uh, and the fresh plasma re really refers to stuff that's never been frozen. And there is some products out like that that are sit, sit at, at uh, either refrigerator, uh, so forth, long lasting, that are not frozen. So again, I would use, if you're using FFP, it would be frozen plasma. Um, and then also a comment here wanting to know if there's any education plan for physician documentation. I think that's a good idea for us on the, down, the, down the line here too, because that certainly does help with the coding. Well, we know yeah, that, so that for the most part, ICD-10 is much more specific. There, there are some yeah. cases, especially in OB, that are not. So that was the purpose of that three-page handout. Uh, and and the, the strategy here for quality improvement of coding of documentation, quality improvement of documentation, is to really share that with uh, 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 OB departments and to have it on labor in post, uh, particularly page one and two of the three page, uh, on labor and delivery. Uh, because it's basically, in most of our EHRs, you have a, a checkbox that you could say labor induced, labor not, but uh, and that makes it a little easier, but you really want them to pick the, pick pick it correctly, i.e. that you want to have induction when it's really an induction. And so the, the more this gets pushed out uh, in, uh, and posted on labor and delivery where they review it, the better. So we did have a companion handout that was really addressing that. Okay. I see another question here. Another question from earlier that we didn't get answered yet. Is there an ICD-10 code that would reflect um, spontaneous rupture membranes prior to onset of labor? Oh, uh, yes, uh, there is a whole, whole series of that. Uh, that's covered in the other other uh, documents that I mentioned. Uh, there is, and what's a little different about it in ICD-10 is that it gives you how long it was ruptured before the onset of labor, a little bit more detail. In ICD-9, it was just 24 hours before the onset of labor. Uh, this includes that, and then just before the onset of labor. You know, and that's uh, uh, but so there are definite codes for that, and I would I would refer you to the general ICD-10 documents that are uh, are on our website too. Okay, and then we have we have one final question on here. What does the approach refer to in the ICD-10 coding? And in parentheses is open versus percutaneous. <laughs> so percutaneous is that you're going through the skin. Uh, i.e., you know, like most IVs, you put a needle through the skin to get into the vein. Uh, there are some procedures, approaches where you're cutting open uh, and ex accessing an organ uh, uh, and even a vein uh, where you're uh, doing that through an incision rather than a, a, a needle through the skin or uh, that not uh, that's pretty close to it, but you know, there's for transfusions, there's never really a role for open. And that's, that's why it's annoying that people have to document that. All right, so we have we have come to the end of our hour, and it looks like uh, most of our questions. It looks like all the questions have been answered, but there there is a question here about where they can find everything on our website, and uh, just so you know, we, everything will be up there within the next couple of days. Not everything is there right now. We will make sure to send an email out to everyone who was registered for this event today with um, directions for where to find both the uh, recording, the slides, and the other documentation that we've mentioned here uh, on our website. So we want to make sure that all everyone has uh, the resources that are available there. But would just like to thank everyone then for joining us today. I'm just thrilled that so many people were on the line and looks like they're great questions. And if you have other questions as they come up, please don't hesitate to reach out to us because we will try to get those answered to you as quickly as possible also. So thank you, everyone, and have a great afternoon. Thank you again.